Hi. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming along today. Today, I'm going to be talking about functional web programming in .NET with the safe stack. And the first question that you like to have is, who am I? Uh, my name's Anthony. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, brownbrown 93 where I occasionally tweet about code. There's my work email address, anthony at compositionalit.com. If you've got any questions after today, then feel free to drop me an email. Um, day to day, I work as an F-sharp consultant, uh, helping deliver things like websites completely written in F-sharp. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today, really, is about how we can actually deliver fully functional websites which use F-sharp along the entire stack. Now, first thing to point out is that it's actually quite easy to do functional programming in .NET, because if you're running on the .NET framework or .NET Core or anything like that, you've got access to a fantastic functional programming language in F-sharp. So first of all, what is F-sharp? Well, as I've just said, it's a functional programming language. The syntax is significantly different to a lot of what people are commonly used to. Uh, it's an ML-based syntax, so it's closer to things like Haskell and OCaml than it is to C-sharp or Java. As I mentioned, it runs on .NET and .NET Core. But it's far from a new language. In fact, it's been in development since the early 2000s. It was really around 2010 that F-sharp came into prominence, though. And it was uh, shipped as part of Visual Studio 2010. At that time, Microsoft gave a justification for the development of F-sharp as it's a fantastic language for things like maths and finance, which it is. But over the years, it's meant that F-sharp has had this kind of stigma attached to it, that you can only ever use F-sharp for maths and finance. And so whenever I get asked this question, which happens quite frequently, the answer is an emphatic no. Right? There's a fantastic thriving ecosystem around the F-sharp language, and it's developed into something much more. And because it's you know, a general purpose language that runs on .NET, it means you've got access to this fantastic ecosystem of things like libraries for web development, for mobile app development, for you know, for all the um, finance applications that you might need to develop, or for everything else that you need to develop as well. In fact, at work, I use it every day for developing everything from console applications to cloud services to web applications. F-sharp is usable absolutely everywhere. And in fact, the techniques that we use within functional programming actually make complex tasks really, really simple and a lot easier to understand. And so today, I'm going to be talking about how we can take all of these benefits of F-sharp and apply them to the things that we have to do on a more day-to-day -day basis. You know, it's not, not all of us are trying to cure cancer or um, send rockets to Mars. For a lot of us, it's just a case of we need to develop a web application which users can log into, tick a few checkboxes that gets updated in a database. And F-sharp is a fantastic fit for that. The way we typically do this in F-sharp is using this thing called the safe stack. So what is safe? Well, on the safe website, it says SAFE is an end-to-end -end functional first stack for cloud-ready web development that emphasizes type-safe programming, which is a lot of words to say it's a set of libraries that lets you develop everything you need to run a website in F-sharp. So SAFE is made up of four core elements. There's a server-side web application framework. There's a hosting environment and platform services. There's a client-side web application framework. And there's a UI framework. Now, these four core elements of SAFE came together because ourselves at Compositional IT and a whole bunch of other people within the F-Sharp community sat down and said, right, 
how are we all developing web applications in F-sharp? If we've got something, if we've got some common ground between us, then it makes sense to standardize on a core set of tools and uh, libraries to make a fantastic experience for everybody else. And so these were the four things that were common across us all. More specifically, for each of those th these things, as part of the safe stack, we've got, for our web application framework, Saturn and Giraffe. For our cloud hosting, we've got either Azure or AWS. For our client-side library, we've got Fable. And then for our UI framework, we've got Elmish. These were the four components that we found to be most in line with what others in the F-sharp community were using. So we looked at these four things. And if you look at it closely, you'll notice that if you look at the first letter, they form a really nice acronym. So we thought this is something that we absolutely have to run with. The great thing about SAFE is everything is .NET Core compatible. So there's no need to have .NET Framework. There's no need to have Mono installed, anything like that. It also means that it runs on Windows, Mac, and Linux. So if you're not a .NET developer and coming at um, F-sharp from the perspective of a Node.js dev working in JavaScript or a Ruby on Rails developer, then you'll be used to like the cross-platform nature of these tools. F-sharp, fantastic in that regard. .NET Core runs great across all three platforms. And we're not tied in to any one particular editor either. You can use Visual Studio 2019, VS Code, JetBrains Rider, all these kinds of tools we've aimed to support as part of the safe stack. So I mentioned that these were the four uh, components that we came up with as we were looking into safe. But why did we actually come up with them? Well, for a lot of people coming into F-sharp, a lot of what they see is brand new. You know, they might have experience doing C-sharp or Java or JavaScript, where you've got a very, in a lot of cases, a very OO approach to solving problems. You know, you'll have something like a, an API controller that you have to inherit from and override methods on, those kind of things. So we wanted to be able to share our experiences across a whole stack of how you can solve these problems better in F-sharp. I mentioned that we'd seen this clear overlap in how lots of other like, sub-communities within the F-sharp world were solving problems. And so we noticed a lot of opportunity for collaboration across all of us. So we're not you know, wasting our time and creating lots of duplicate content out there that makes it confusing for beginners to get started. And obviously, it, as I mentioned, it makes a really nice acronym, SAFE. Works well. So let's now move on to looking at the components individually. Let's start with our backend web services, our S. In this case, Saturn. Now, Saturn doesn't exist in a vacuum. Saturn is actually part of the ASP.NET ecosystem. And Saturn sits at the very top layer of our web application stack. Saturn is a nice library for a lot of um, idiomatic F-sharp configuration of um, .NET or ASP.NET web applications, but it also provides a lot of new and interesting approaches to developing uh, APIs as well, which we'll see later on. Saturn itself, though, sits on top of this library called Giraffe. If you've had any exposure to F-sharp, you might have heard of Giraffe. It's a library that provides functional style combinators to allow you to develop web applications in a more functional style. So rather than relying on classes, we're instead relying on functions. Underneath Giraffe is ASP.NET Core. I'm sure you're all aware, or at least have heard of ASP.NET Core. You know, it's the hip new thing in Microsoft, and what Microsoft have pretty much devoted their um, time going forwards towards. And at the bottom of the stack there, we've got Kestrel. So the great thing about Saturn is that whilst we've got all this F-sharp specific 
tooling and library, what we've actually got is the ability to use all this underlying ASP.NET Core ecosystem. So it's no longer a case of having to reinvent the wheel if you're doing something in F-sharp. What you're able to do instead is if Microsoft come out and decide they're going to rewrite that popular open source library that everybody else is using and force you to use it, great. You can just use their implementation now rather than having to rewrite your own implementation. Or you know, if you need to do use something that you really don't want to have to implement yourself, for example, Active Directory integration, that's all supported thanks to the ASP.NET Core Active Directory libraries. But a big draw of Saturn is it provides some really nice abstractions for doing things in F-sharp that would look a bit awkward at times if you were writing them in F-sharp. So Saturn provides abstractions for things like your overall application configuration. It provides configuration for things like how you actually direct all your um, incoming web requests to all your different routes. We also have these abstractions to enable us to build better pipelines. So as a request comes in, how should we modify that request? How should we modify the response that gets sent back? Should we actually just drop the request entirely? And finally, we've got this nice controller abstraction, which provides us with an alternative way of creating CRUD-style um, APIs. You know, so if you're just doing things that need create, read, update, delete. Saturn's got abstractions that make it a little bit more idiomatic and a little bit uh, easier. Let's start with configuration. I'm sure if you've used ASP.NET Core, then you've had to set up your ASP.NET Core app, and you've got this big chain of dot use blah, dot use blah, dot use blah. You can do that in F -sharp if you want to, but Saturn uses a different approach. So under the hood, it's still using all of those libraries. It's still using all of those calls. But in F sharp, method chaining isn't as common. It's not like the idiomatic way of doing things. So Saturn provides these computation expressions. And we'll see an example of one in just a second. It's an entirely strongly typed configuration. Right? So it looks, there's no types defined anywhere or anything like that from what you see, but under the hood, everything is strongly typed. So you can't be accidentally passing in the wrong thing anywhere. Here is a very simple application. And we've got this application uh, computation expression. You can see along the top there, we've got let app equal application curly bracket. And then we've got each of these small declarative statements. So we want to say we've got a URL which is listening on uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, and a random port. We're going to use a router as part of our application, and we specify our router elsewhere. We say we want a memory cache as part of our application. We want to serve static content from a public path. We want to configure our serialization using that service config that we've got there, and we want to use gzip. And then we call run app at the bottom. So if you've used ASP.NET Core in the past, a lot of the things that you're seeing here, you might be able to see how they map onto the actual underlying ASP.NET Core method calls. Next up are routers. So routers are how Saturn links an incoming web request's path to a function that you've got running on your server. One of the really interesting things is the fact that routers are all strongly typed, even in the URL parameters. Sounds a bit strange, but you'll see what I mean in just a second. And the great thing about routers is they follow one of the key principles of functional programming, which is everything should be composable. Right? You should be able to say, I've got a router. I want to join another router up to that, and another router up to that, and another router up to that. So you can create small, focused components of your application and then link them together in stages. So here's an example of a router. 
Now, because this is F sharp, we're going to read bottom to top rather than top to bottom. So at the bottom here, I've got this router. This router here is going to be saying, whenever I receive a request, I'm going to check my URL, and I'm going to divert it where it's needed. So let's start with this get at the bottom. We say, if we get something that's on the path slash foo, we're going to pass through into the get foo method. But if we receive something which is on the path slash API slash office, what we're actually going to do is we're going to forward all of our requests into our child router. So you can start to see how this might enable you to compose your application a little bit differently. Yeah, so you can focus on like per application components. So you can have a file for all of your office API, a file for all of your people API. So you can focus on a specific problem area in a specific part of your application. And in this router at the top, we say if we've just got get slash, then we just return all of our officers. But we've got this get f slash percent s here. So if any of you have done any C long, long ago, you might remember calling things like printf in C, where you specify a format string, and the C compiler will format all of your um, string out for you. F sharp also uses printf. And it uses you know, percent %s, percent %d, these kind of identifiers. Except what F sharp does is the compiler is smart enough to know that that percent %s means that you need, it, you need a string in there. And so this get office by id function, if that's not got a string as a parameter, it'll fail to compile. So if you expect your id to be an integer, and you pass get office by ID, which has got an integer parameter, your application will fail to compile at this point. And so you've then either got to fix your get office by ID function to take in a string instead of an integer, or you've got to fix your URL path to take in an integer, or take in an integer rather than a string. Sometimes, though, we want a bit more of a higher level on top of just functions. right? We want an abstraction for dealing with more objects. So if you kind of think as routers as paths to functions, controllers are more like paths to objects. And they provide these abstractions for doing all of your CRUD op operations. So if you want to do create, read, update, delete, controllers are a great fit for that. And another great thing about them is they're completely composable with anything else that takes in a URL. So if you've got a router, then you can have a controller as a child of a router. You can have a controller as a child of a controller. You can use all of these kind of composition ideas that make functional programming a really attractive solution. Let's take a look at the controller now. Once again, F sharp, so reading bottom to top. What we've got is an example of an API where we might have, say, a meeting room booking service. Right? So we've got a meeting. A meeting takes place in an office. So we've got an API that provides all of our offices, an API that provides all of our meetings. At the bottom here, we've got our controller that handles our offices. And so we use this computation expression again, similar to how we did when we used application, similar to how we did when we used router. We have this index here. Index takes in a function, which is just going to allow us to list out everything. So we don't have any URL parameters in this case. We just want uh, the overall list of what's available at that resource. If we want a specific thing, though, then we can implement show. So in that case, we get an ID. And we can view specific ID. And under the hood, what Saturn is going to do is it's going to work on idiomatic REST API um, concepts. And so if you've got this office controller running at slash office, your index is going to be get slash office. Your show is going to be get slash office slash ID. 
you've also got the ability to do delete, update, all sorts in there. And all of those are going to be mapped under the hood into the appropriate uh, HTTP verbs. But one thing that I've said is we can have composable controllers. So we've got our subcontroller word here. And that says, I've got a meetings controller, which is going to be a child of my current office controller. And what that's going to do is you'll notice that it takes in a parameter at the top there. Saturn knows that if you've got something like slash office slash ID slash meetings, you're going to need that office ID to be able to list out all of your meetings related to it. And so it provides it in there. And you can then do the exact same thing. So indexes, you can do your show, your update, your delete. Another concept is pipelines. So we can create these composable pipelines in Saturn. And these are the things that operate on the request and the response. And they provide multiple operations that we're likely to want to do. So for every request that comes into our web API, we can choose to either modify the incoming request so we could choose to add an extra header if we needed to. Uh, we could modify the outgoing response, so we could change the serialization technology that we're using. Or we could just drop the request entirely. So in that case, you know, somebody's failed to supply their authentication information. And so here's an example of a pipeline. Once again, you'll notice computation expression as a way of actually building the thing up. These things are entirely composable as well using this plug word there. So we can plug in an extra pipeline and feed a pipeline through a pipeline. And then it's just a case of things like set header or requires authentication. All these kind of things are things that are going to happen at every stage for every request that comes in. And so we can create as many pipelines as we want. We can compose them all together. And we can be selective where we apply them. If we only want to apply them to one of our controllers, fine. We'll only apply it to that controller. If we want to apply it to all of them, we can do that as well. Saturn itself is built on top of Giraffe, which is on top of ASP.NET Core, which allows us to use all that ASP.NET middleware that's already been written and that people are continuing to develop. And another great thing is we can run Saturn wherever we can host ASP.NET Core. So we can host it on Kestrel. We can host it in places like Azure Functions. You can even host it in AWS Lambda as well. It's a case of you're already able to use this entire ecosystem of technologies that are already available to us. That's the back end. How about the front end? It's all well and good being able to develop our web services in F-sharp, but are we able to bring concepts like strong static typing to the front end where JavaScript reigns supreme? Well, yeah, we can with this tool called Fable, which is an F-sharp to JavaScript compiler, which takes your F-sharp and compiles it into readable modern JavaScript, which runs in any web browser. So that's for me, one of, the ma one of the important things as well, the readable modern JavaScript. It's not a case of a tool generating just kind of cobbled together JavaScript. Under the hood, this is using technologies like Babel to generate standards compliant JavaScript, which is understandable and debuggable. But because we're running F -sharp on the front end and F -sharp on the back end, one of the great things that we're able to do is share code. So if we've got things like types and functions, we can take our .NET Core API you know, that we've written in Giraffe or Saturn and bring our client-side JavaScript as well, so the stuff that we've written in Fable and Elmish, and share it across the two. So if you've got stuff like validation logic, just use it across both your front end and your back end. If you've got your API model, share it across both rather than rewriting it twice in two very different languages. One of the interesting things about Fable, though, is it actually is designed to be a part of the JavaScript ecosystem. So it's not designed to 
burn everything to the ground and start from scratch. What you're able to do is reuse all of the existing JavaScript tooling that you know. So it integrates with things like Webpack. If you're used to the Redux and React Dev tools, then these are the exact kind of things you'll be using if you're creating Fable applications. And another great thing is it allows you to use all those existing JavaScript libraries. So Fable itself is distributed through NPM, the actual compiler and everything. So you can consume any other libraries that are on NPM as well. So if you need to use LeftPad, then feel free to go and use LeftPad. But it's not enough that we can just write our F sharp on the front end because, well, We've got F sharp code, and we know what good F sharp code looks like. So let's try and write good F sharp code everywhere. Good F sharp code for me is immutable. It's readable. It makes sense. You can see it, and you can reason about what's going to happen. And for me, a lot of UI programming is done wrong. For me, mutability in your UI is a significant liability that leads to weird bugs and race conditions that you don't know what to do about and are nigh and impossible to debug. There's this complexity involved with handling asynchronous operations. You know, you've got a UI, you click a button, you go off to a web server. Your web server comes back. In the meantime, your UI might have completely changed. How do you cope with that? You know, what do you do? There's also this lack of composability of components. So if you've got this one page that you've done fantastically in MVVM, there was this promise that you'd be able to just take this page and move it anywhere. And that's great in theory, but in practice, it's never quite worked out like that. You've always ended up having a bit of application-specific logic somewhere to make it work. And that makes it difficult to take one page that you've written somewhere and put it somewhere completely different. And then we've got all this difficulty of doing stuff on the main thread. Like, why should I have to care what thread my application is currently running on and whether I can do stuff to the UI or not? So instead of doing all this, let's talk about functional programming concepts and how we can apply those to the UI. So, in functional programming, you might have been exposed to things like folds or reduce, or if you've been using link, you might have used things like aggregate. In this case, we start off with an initial state. Yeah, we have this initial state that describes our application on startup. We can then render that state to our UI. So we can just paint the picture of our UI of what it is for that current state. Then every time something on the UI happens, we're going to dispatch a command. And that command is going to be picked up by an update function, and that update function is going to generate a completely new state. Then once we've got that new state, we just render the whole thing out again. All right? So to show it in a diagram, if we start in the middle, we've got our model. We're going to render out our model into a view, and that's going to be sent to our web browser. Whenever we do something, like interact with that page or interact with the web browser, we're going to fire off an event. That event gets mapped into a command. That command then gets passed into our update function, which takes in the model at the point in time it received the update command. From there, we can look at the current state, and we can look at the thing that wants to change the current state and work out, is it something that is valid for a change, or is it something that we should just ignore or do something like raise an error about? And we can just keep repeating this and repeating this and repeating this forever and ever and ever. Let's see how we do it in F sharp. So what I've got here is a very simple model to demonstrate a counter. I've got this counter model at the top, 
which has just got an integer for the counter value. And then I've got a set of commands that we might commonly use. So we've got the ability to increment, to decrement, and to reset. Automatically, you can see straight away exactly what it is that my application is going to be doing. Right? This is the entirety of the state within my application. How do I then render my state out? You know, what does that counter value look like? Well, we can just describe it with HTML. You know, we've got a div. And because we've been passed in our model, we can just use our model as part of our view. So in this case, we've got a h1 tag, so for a heading. And then we've got a button. And we've got another div down here with our counter value in. Another thing we've been passed in is this dispatch value. So dispatch is a function that allows us to dispatch commands into our update logic. And so whenever we click the plus button, we're going to dispatch an increment command. Whenever we click the minus button, we're going to dispatch a decrement command. That's all there is to it. When it comes to the update, we have an initial value, which is the starting value of our application. In the case where you've got a brand new web page open, it makes sense that you're going to have a counter that is initialized to 0. It might also make sense that you have a counter that's initialized to 100. But it's obvious what your initial state is. We've then got our update. Our update is going to take in a command, which we dispatched from our UI on our last slide, and the existing model. So what came out of the last update? Or if there was no last update, what was the initial state? And then what we can do is we can pattern match across it. And we can say, was it an increment? Great. Then our state should be state plus 1. Was it a decrement? Then it should be state minus 1. Was it a reset? In that case, reset it back to the initial state. Because this is F sharp, because this is discriminated unions, if we missed out one of these cases, the compiler is going to complain at us and say, why haven't you considered the case where you've got a reset event come in from the UI? It forces us to think about cases which we might not have ordinarily considered because they weren't immediately obvious. And then it's just a case of joining the components together. So we say, I'm going to create a simple application. Here's my initial state. Here's my update function. Here's my view. Join them all together build it as part of a React application, and mount it on this um, HTML element, and just run the whole program. And I'm going to let Elmish deal with it all. Let Elmish deal with the whole concept of multi-threading. You know, let Elmish deal with updating the UI, which under the hood uses React. So you get great performance, because you're not just re-rendering the whole UI. The fantastic thing is, Whilst this talk is about web development, Elmish isn't just for the web. Using Elmish, you can write things like console applications. You can write WPF apps. You can write Xamarin Forms apps. And you can write Fable apps, as we've seen here. That's fantastic. You've now got your full application. It's all written, and it's running great on your local machine. For a lot of people, though, they want to actually deploy it so that people can see it somewhere. Within SAFE, we've got quite a few different options. Um, we've got things like Azure. Uh, we've got Docker. We've got Kubernetes. We've got Google Cloud, all sorts. The ones that we tend to focus on, though, are Azure and Docker. I'm just going to talk briefly about the Azure side now. So as part of the safe template, we've got one-click deploy, but we've done it right, right? So we've got the whole command line tooling built for you. And so we just generate a build script that you can consume as part of your CI process or as part of your local development process. So you get the ability to do build deploy locally, and it'll, it'll deploy. But you can take that, drop it onto your build server, and run one-click deploy there as well. We also provide things like repeatable deployments with Azure Resource Manager. So we know what 
components are required to get a safe application working. And so we've supplied an ARM template with things like the Azure App Service that will be needed. We've also provisioned an Azure SQL database and Azure storage in there, because these are the common sorts of things that people are going to need when they're developing their applications to run on Azure. And as I said, we can deploy from CLI, from the fake scripts, from the build server, from anywhere, because we've got one-click deploy that's done right. We've also provided really deep integration with Azure platform services. So we've got things like an Azure, type, an Azure storage type provider. So you can point your f -sharp compiler at your Azure storage instance, and the f -sharp compiler will look across your Azure storage and say, OK, you've got a container which has got this folder, which has got this folder, and this folder, and this folder. And it will generate these as statically provided parameters that you can use at compile time. So you get type checking of data that is stored in your Azure storage account. We've also got things like automatic App Insights integration. So you can publish events from Saturn because it uses .NET Core. So under the hood, it's using the ASP.NET Core App Insights integration. There's also work being done to publish events from Fable. So you know, you, somebody clicks on a button in your UI, you publish that event to App Insights so you can use it later on. That's not all, though. That's the library side. But there's more to development than just gluing libraries together. You need to make sure that it's an actual enjoyable experience for people who are using those libraries. And we've invested quite heavily into that. Safe adds terminology for sharing experiences. right? So it's a case of if you need to add authentication for a safe app, you're not going to have to go to a whole bunch of different places and try and glue together little snippets of code which work in one example, but not necessarily in another. We've also invested in things like automated tooling for creating safe apps. So we've got a .NET Core template, which I'll be showing later on. There's also better end-to-end -end documentation. As I say, this links quite heavily with the concept of sharing experiences, the terminology required for that, because you can write a blog post on, here's how I did authentication in SAFE, and people know that that means Saturn, Fable, Elmish, and possibly some deployment to Azure as well. And it also means that we can provide better end-to-end -end tooling. So we're able to really embrace new concepts in development with things like hot reloading of your application and not having to rely on F5 debug constantly. It also means that we can provide more in-depth training and samples. You know, we're not just limited to, here's a web API that I wrote in Saturn, and here's a small front end for a fake back end that I wrote. We're able to develop more, bi more larger applications, which provide best practices on how you go about developing applications in F-sharp. So let me just talk briefly about the safe dev process. This is one of the things that I mentioned as, you know, we want to have better end-to-end -end tooling. And typically, you can have a process that looks something like the following. So you change your code, you compile it, you start your application, you hit F5, you wait for it to hit breakpoint, you find out what's gone wrong. OK, right, that was, that was silly of me. Why did I do that? Let me change it. You change it, you wait for it to compile, you start your application again, you debug, and then you realize that you actually made a mistake in the change as well. And so you can have this really long feedback cycle of waiting you know, a few minutes between making a small change and having your application ready to be debugged again. Safe, we've focused on this concept of just hot reloading your application constantly. So whenever you save, we're going to recompile. And as part of that recompile, we're just going to make that new version of your application live constantly. So what you're then able to do is just hack away at some code, flip back to your web browser, and see that everything's updated. 
for a lot of people as well, commercial support was a deal breaker. You know, a lot of the F-sharp world is just open source applications and open source libraries. And this, for a lot of people, was a bit alarming because they didn't know who to turn to if they needed support. So the safe brand now enables all the F-sharp consultancies out there to focus on what it is that they can help people with in the F-sharp world. And it's now reducing the risk of adoption of F-sharp for a lot of organizations out there. Consistent documentation is another one. We've got the safe brand, and it allows for end-to-end -end coverage of functionality, which affects the whole stack. You know, Previously, if you'd just got Saturn, it was one thing to have an API. It was one thing to have an API with authentication. It was then something completely different to integrate that authentication with your JavaScript front end, or your mobile app, or whatever it might be. So safe really does allow developers to get up to speed on the full stack features very quickly. And we've got a complete documentation site that's available there at safestack.github.io slash docs. Right. You've all listened to me talk for quite a while now, so let's go on to the code side of things. Code-wise, we've got the safe template. So as part of that, we've got a .NET Core template, which enables you to configure your application exactly as you want it. We've got options on the server of, do you want Saturn, or do you just want Giraffe, the layer below Saturn? Do you want layout? You know, do you want CSS files included? Do you want to use something like Fulma, which is, I don't know if any of you have ever used the CSS library Bulma, similar to Bootstrap, but Fulma is an F-sharp library that provides type-safe components built on top of Bulma. We've got things like remoting, which is kind of like a RPC-style framework for F-sharp across JavaScript clients and F-sharp backends. Deployment, you've got things like no deployment. You know, I, I'm going to handle that myself. We've got things like Docker or Azure as well. JavaScript dependencies, if you want to use NPM, use NPM. If you want to use Yarn, use Yarn. We've then got fake scripts, our build scripts. So fake is an F-sharp build tool, similar to like Cake um, in C-sharp. And this enables you, ha enables you to handle all of your build and run, all of your deployment. We also provide things like custom Docker files for bundling up all your application so that it can be created as a Docker container. Well, let's take a look at the safe template. So I've got a new safe template that I've created here. And we provide really nice integration with VS Code. So if you've not got anything installed related to F-sharp, what we do is we provide all of the recommendations that you need to get started quickly with developing F-sharp applications in VS Code. So you'd need things like the C-sharp extension. Um, because that's how the .NET Core debugger is shipped in VS Code. You want things like Ionide F-Sharp for all of your F-Sharp IntelliSense support. And then when we've got our application, we've got our client side with everything that's needed to scaffold out a new Elmish application running in the browser. And we've got our server-side application, which has got everything we need in it to be running our Saturn API. And we also provide all the build scripts. So it's just a case of doing fake build run. And then I can leave that be whilst I show off some of the code here. You know, we've got our Saturn API. We provide examples of how you know, to use a Saturn API. If we go into our client side, we've got a full Elmish app that gets scaffolded that you can then modify to your usage. In terms of additional tooling, we've got our Webpack config all supplied out of the box, so you don't have to mess around trying to spend six hours setting up your project. You can dive straight into coding. 
we've got all of the ARM templates if you're doing this with Azure, so that you can deploy instantly to Azure. And then, as my application is running, I can see it running in my web browser. And so I can click the button and update the state. It's going to pull down the state from my API that I've got there initially. I've got all this integration with the existing JavaScript toolchain. You know, I can go and see that using the Redux dev tools, I've had this increment command go through uh, five times. If I click it again, I can see it go through there. I get full time travel debugging as well. So I've just moved back to this command. And if I come here, you can see that my state has transitioned to what it was at the point of that command. So it provides different opportunities for debugging. Very simple applications like that are fantastic as a template to get you up and running, but it can be difficult understanding how to structure much larger, broader applications which cover multiple different areas. And so as part of that, we've provided example applications. We've got a safe dojo. This is more of a fill in the blanks exercise. So what it'll do is it'll give you a starter application and it walks you through Here's what you need to change to add this feature. This feature demonstrates how Elmish works, how Saturn APIs work. There's also the Safe Bookstore. This is a pretty large application, which includes things like storage, deployment with Docker, authentication is in there as well. And we've got an example put together, which is the Safe Search. This is another larger application and includes integration with things like Azure as well. So how do you use Azure Search? How do you use Azure Storage? So Safe Search is all available up on GitHub. You can pull this down, deploy it as you want. There is also a demo website up where you can search for a location in the UK, and it'll pull down properties relating to your search location. And under the hood, we're using all these services like Azure Search, like Azure Storage. And so you can see how you can use all these with F Sharp. So we've got this entire application here which you can dive into and see best practices for doing idiomatic web applications in F Sharp. Next up, we've got the Safe Dojo. So the Safe Dojo is an introductory application to help you get started developing web applications in F Sharp. So this is a workshop that I've done with a few user groups now as well. And we provide you with this nearly complete web application with just a few missing pieces. You can pick this up, and you can follow the instructions file, and it's going to guide you through how to add things like adding a new endpoint to your API. It'll cover adding shared code that you can consume across your front end and your back end. You can add a map using Bing Maps. You can implement weather API, which goes to an external endpoint. And I've had great success running this with people who have got a lot of experience with F Sharp, but not, might not have looked at the web side of things. But it's also equally approachable by people who have no F Sharp web experience. And I've seen groups of people who have not touched F Sharp before manage to go through this in an hour and a half to two hours. And that's all available on GitHub as part of, under the uh, Compositional IT organization. If you're interested in learning more about SafeStack, then I recommend following the SafeStack Twitter account, at safe underscore stack. 
or watching the GitHub organization at github.com slash safestack, or visiting the uh, Safestack website at safestack.github.io. If you've got any questions, we can have a few questions now. If there's anything that you get think of when you get back to your office next week, and you think, oh, I wish I'd asked that, don't be afraid of dropping me an email, and I'll try and direct you to the right resources. Thank you for that. Has anybody got any questions? Yeah, we've got a question here. So the question is, is there anything like Swagger integration available for things like Saturn? Uh, it is currently actively being worked on. Um, it's hoped that it'll be included as part of the Giraffe library. Um, and I know there's been a lot of work involved in doing that. But as far as I'm aware, currently it's been delayed as part of the Microsoft endpoint-based routing. It's going to provide a different approach to doing it. And so I think the decisions have been made to postpone it a little while. Um, otherwise, it's going to be a case of doing one thing and then having to reinvent the wheel a few months later when .NET or ASP.NET Core 3 comes out, I think. Any other questions? No questions? So, Suave, um, we originally wanted to make safe, you know, quite an open concept. And so we originally did say you could use Suave or Saturn or Giraffe. But we found it quite limiting because Suave, you know, it's its own dedicated thing. Saturn runs on ASP.NET Core. We found ourselves using Saturn a lot more and reaching out to it a lot more just because we've got that whole ASP.NET Core ecosystem available under the hood. It made it difficult for us to recommend Suave as an option, because you're going to end up just reinventing the wheel for a lot of use cases. And so we just ultimately decided, as the template started to grow and we added more features to it, that Suave we can't really recommend and maintain going forwards. Any other questions? I am aware that it's uh, five minutes until lunch, so I don't want that to sway your decision of whether you want to ask a question. If not, we're friends with Azure and AWS, but what about Google Cloud? Yes, we do support um, Google Cloud. Um, so as part of the safe template, one of the options that's available if I come to the Safe Stack website um, and go into FAQ uh, components, Safe Template, deployment options, there it is. Um, we do have a pretty broad range of deployment options now. Uh, we tend to focus on Azure and AWS because that's what the core maintainers are mostly comfortable with, uh, Docker as well, actually. Um, but there is support there for deploying to Google Cloud App Engine or Google Cloud Kubernetes Engine, or Heroku, or IIS. So these are all options available if you do want to use something a bit different to Azure or AWS. Any other questions? Going, going, gone. <laughs>